okay we'll uh, get started so we were talking about augmented lagrangian method in the previous class so let me remind you i want to minimize f of x h x equals to 0 x is in some capital set x and then one of the algorithms we talked about and i have not mentioned the name but i want you to remember the name method of multipliers uh, the algorithm is i define my x k to be argmin l c k x lambda k x is in capital x and then i define my lambda k plus 1 equals lambda k plus c k h x k and you need to pick c k uh, arbitrarily you can pick ck any way you want as long as it's going to infinity as k goes to infinity so this was the algorithm we have been talking about uh, so far and you have done an assignment which is due today on this particular algorithm what is the problem what is the drawback with this algorithm uh, no i mean this is a problem we need to solve so what is the problem with this running this algorithm you have done this algorithm now what's uh, what would happen if you were solving it for a general nonlinear problem yeah like ck is too big it could oscillate uh, right so that's definitely one of the issues so you want ck to not be that big but that's a requirement for this algorithm that ck has to go to infinity uh, See, the problem in this algorithm is that I need to solve this argument at every point k, right? So, what does calculating an argument require? An infinite number of iterations, right? Some sort of gradient descent needs to be done or some sort of optimization over convex set needs to be done at every point of time. Each of this argument will involve 10, 15, 20, 30 operations and then you'll have to run outer iteration where k can go from 1 to 50, 1 to 100 and so on for a general nonlinear problem. I don't want to solve this argument at every point of time. I don't want to spend 30 iterations solving this problem only to learn that I need to solve this problem all over again after just changing one variable which is lambda k. What should I do? So let's try to simplify the problem. So my x is equals to Rn. I am going to keep Ck to be constant for now. And I don't want to do this argument at every point of time. What would you do? Any thoughts? So here is one way to simplify algorithms. It's a generic method. It will not work all the time, but Certainly it works sometimes and it'll work today. So instead of solving this all the way to argument, I'm just going to take the first order gradient step. Remember we did that also in the barrier method for linear programming, where we just took one Newton step at every point of time instead of taking multiple Newton step to get to the uh, central path. So we'll do the same thing here today. I'm going to pick my xk plus one to be xk minus alpha and I'm going to pick lambda k plus 1 
So no longer I'm taking, so this is not LC, so I'll talk about the LC part later on. But I'm taking one gradient step of minimizing the Lagrangian, and then I'm taking a step uh, of updating lambda k, but now my step size is equal to alpha. So I picked a constant alpha, and now I'm running this iteration separately, this iteration separately, and then updating xk and lambda k, and then running this iteration all over again. So instead of having an argument and an update equation for lambda k, I'm just taking the first gradient step and then updating lambda k, and I can do this actually parallelly. So I can update xk separately and I can update lambda k separately, collect all the information, compute the gradient, and do, all, do this operation all over again. So if you're solving very large scale optimization problems, uh, this sort of approach is very, very beneficial. So imagine if you are uh, running some operations of the order of optimizing something for McDonald's. So you have 10,000 stores all over the world. Some stuff needs to be transported from here and there. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Bill, Ga Bill Gate owns the farmland that supplies potatoes to McDonald's. So Bill Gates has farmland somewhere, and then it supplies potato to all the McDonald's stores across the US, and you may have like, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 McDonald's stores. So you have to do the optimization. It's quite likely that you won't be able to optimize by keeping all the xk and lambda k within the same, same server. You might have to distribute it over multiple servers, in which case an algorithm of this type will be very time consuming, whereas an algorithm of this type will be very, very fast, right? And so we want to run an algorithm of this type. Now the big question is, I don't even know if this algorithm is going to converge or not converge, right? So I cooked up an algorithm, so I'm inspired by this algorithm, but I don't want to run this algorithm because I'm optimizing something for McDonald's, so I can't optimize it, so I took a shortcut, this is an algorithm I can definitely run on multiple servers. But now the question is, how do I know that this algorithm will actually converge to x star lambda star? So that is the question we want to discuss today. So at what point of time this xk and lambda k would converge? So let's think about it. So when is xk and xk plus one the same? When this thing is equal to zero? And when is lambda k plus one and lambda k same? When this thing is equal to zero, right? So, so at, the, at this point, my x, Right, so I have the gradient of the first derivative of the Lagrangian is zero, and then h of x star is zero, and this is the solution we have been looking for, for this particular problem. So now the only question we need to talk about is about the convergence of this algorithm to a specific point, x star lambda star. In order to understand the convergence, I'm going to talk about uh, Banach contraction mapping theorem today. And uh, let me write down what the statement of this theorem is. We'll go ahead and prove this result but I'll give you the intuition about why this result is important. So I have a map T from Rn to Rn. And it satisfies Tx1 minus Tx2 is less than or equal to beta norm x1 minus x2 and beta is less than 1. And this could be any norm. You can pick any norm.
consider the sequence xk plus 1 equals to txk. So I have beta less than 1, I can pick any norm here on Rn and I am considering, I am starting from a, some random initial point x0 and I am considering this particular sequence that is coming out of applying this map t again and again. This kind of map is known as a contraction map, a map that satisfies this condition with beta less than 1, it is called a contraction map. So, So this map is called a contraction map. What do you think is going to happen to this sequence? Okay, so let's see what this what this uh, sequence is trying to do. So I start with a point x1 and x2, and then I get t of x1 and t of x2 and I look at this distance and I look at this distance let's say this is d1 and this is d2 what does this uh, statement says it's a contraction map so d2 must be less than equal to beta times t1 so the distance is contracting okay that's why it's a contraction map this distance is contracting under the influence of this map t. Okay, so this distance is contracting. So let's look at this sequence. Maybe I'll draw the sequence here. So I start with x0 then I have t of x0 equals to x1, then x2, then x3, and so on. What is happening in this sequence? If you look at the successive iterates, the distance is smaller than the distance here. This distance is smaller than the distance here. So every time I, I go to the next iterate, the distance is going to be smaller and smaller. What does that imply? What is hap happening to the sequence? The sequence is converging. So this one converges to a point called x star. Let's call that convergent point x star. Now I start with another sequence. Let's say x naught prime. I get x one prime. And I'm going to also have a similar property what is this sequence going to converge to? Okay, so let's go back to that uh, let's look at it. So if I look at this distance and I look at this distance, what happens? So this is remember this is T of X naught prime and this is T of X naught. So this distance is smaller than this distance. If I look at x2 prime and I look at this distance, that distance is going to be smaller than this distance and I can keep iterating. What's going to happen to this sequence, xk prime sequence? It's also going to converge to the same point x star. So no matter from where I start, I'm going to converge to x star. So this x star is actually called a unique fixed point, which is the unique fixed point of t. So what is the fixed point? t of x star is equal to x star.
This is the theorem. This is the Banach contraction mapping theorem. Okay, so there are two things happening here. The first thing is if I look at one sequence, that sequence is converging to X star. If I look at construct another sequence, it's also going to converge to the same point. And if I construct another sequence, it's going to converge to the same point. So the contraction mapping theorem is saying you have a contraction map. You can pick any norm, it doesn't matter what norm you pick. So you have a contraction map under this norm. So you could have a situation where you have a map, it is contraction with respect to a specific norm, but it is not a contraction with respect to some other norm. So it could be contraction with respect to L1 norm, but not a contraction with respect to L2 norm. So you can have those kind of situation. So you have to pick the norm carefully. It's not obvious what norm would work, but uh, Generally, L2 norm, L infinity norm, LP norms, those are the norms that people pick. Sometimes you could have weighted L, L infinity norm. So we have not talked about some of those norms, but this, this theorem is something that you will, you will see in many classes in the future. So, uh, so depending on which class you are picking, you might take L2 norm, L infinity norm, whatever, right? So there are lots of norms that you can pick. And then T will be contraction under that specific norm. Okay, so T is a contraction under that specific norm with beta less than one. You look at a sequence, that sequence is going to converge to X star, which is the unique fixed point of T. So a fixed point of this map is such that if you apply the map on the fixed point, the point doesn't change. Okay, you get the same point again. And remember this map maps Rn to Rn. Now let's go back to this particular example. So this is in Rn, this is in Rm, and I'm going to define T of xk lambda k is xk minus alpha gradient L xk lambda k lambda k plus alpha h of xk. So this is my map T. So T is a map here from Rn plus m to Rn plus m. So how do I know if this point is going to converge to, oh, the other thing is, uh, the other thing that you will notice is the fixed point of T is actually X star lambda star. So if I put X star and lambda star here, then this gradient is equal to zero. That's the first order condition for the Lagrange multiplier theorem. And then this H of X star is equal to zero, so you get lambda star. So fixed point here is X star lambda star. So once I know this theorem, all I have to show is that this particular map is a contraction. And if it is a contraction, then it's going to converge to the fixed point, which is X star lambda star. You've also seen this fixed point equation in the context of linear system, which you have used several times in this class so far. Let me remind you the result. So you have used T of X equals to AX plus B. And if rho of A is less than one, then you know that there is a point T of X star equals to X star, which is given by I minus A inverse B, right? So this is something, this is the fact you have used several times in the class so far, right? For proving convergence and so on. 
Okay. So you've already used this result several times in this course. But today we are going to, so this is the linear version where T is a linear map and the spectral radius of A is less than 1. That the reason why we want the spectral radius of A to be less than 1 is because beta needs to be less than 1 here. And then you know that T is going to converge. Like uh, the sequence xk is going to converge to x star, which satisfies that, that expression. OK, any questions so far? Can you just clarify how you're getting that inequality into the form for the linear contraction map? So how, do I, how am I getting this inequality? I wasn't yeah. going with that. Form. Yeah, OK. So let's see. OK, perfect. So let's look at that. So t of x equals to ax plus b, rho of a is less than 1. So what is t of x1 minus t of x2? Right? So one of the results from linear algebra is if rho of a is less than 1, then there exists a norm such that A, let me put Y here. I don't want to confuse with X again and again. Okay, I need to write it a bit more carefully. Rho A is less than 1. Then for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a norm such that uh, norm of a y is less than or equal to rho a plus epsilon times norm of y. We have not covered this particular result in the class. I mean, we covered it at the very beginning, like uh, in lecture one or two, but we have not. Uh, we have not used it so far, okay? But this is the first time when we are going to use it. So I'm going to pick epsilon, 1 minus rho a over 2. And I'm going to get beta to be equal to, what is my beta? Beta is rho a plus epsilon, which is strictly less than 1. Okay, so that's how we are using the contraction mapping theorem in the context of a linear system. Okay, questions? No questions? Can I have a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Can you just use the induced to norm? Uh, not really. Only if A is positive definite, then you can use 2 norm. Uh, just the, the sub-multiplicative property of the 2 norm. Take the 2 norm of Tx1 minus Tx2 is equal to the 2 norm of that, which is less or equal than the 2 norm of A. Not 2 norm of A. It, uh, uh, yeah, it'll be like A transpose A, the maximum eigenvalue of the A transpose A. Oh, that's right. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So if rho A is less than 1, then rho of A transpose A need not be less than 1. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's the problem. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's a very complicated thing to do. <laughs> so his question was, I think it's important to note that. So let me tell you what his question was. His question was, why don't we just take the two norm here and get done with this? So the problem here is, If I pick the 2 norm, I think it is rho of A transpose A, the 2 norm, and maybe there is a square root here as well. Yes. And then this rho is not equal to rho of A. So this is less than 1. This need not be less than 1. You can construct examples where this is less than 1, but this is not. I don't have example on top of my head, but 
it's a well known fact in linear algebra any other question no okay cool so now we have all agreed that we need to figure out if t is a contraction map or not so we won't go through the proof of showing that t is a contraction map but i'll tell you the conditions under which t is a contraction map what i want to do today is i want to go through the proof of this particular result both because this result is very important in the optimization and in differential equations and in partial differential equation and in fluid dynamics and in like all kinds of stochastic processes probability theory reinforcement learning and so on so in every such class you will go through this particular result except that this rn might change from rn to something else in different different classes but anyways i think the the important thing is to know that this result exists and this is one of the most important result in mathematics and so i want to go through the proof because the proof is surprisingly very simple okay let me remind you again of a result that we talked about again in lecture 1 or 2 which is cauchy sequence so i have xk is cauchy if and only if can someone tell me what the definition was it's in your lecture 1 or 2 notes no if and if only if what for every Has that norm of not k minus one norm of not x bar <laughs> sorry x m. less than epsilon perfect that's a cauchy sequence and then we also know a fact that xk converges to x bar so if it's a cauchy sequence then it's going to converge to x bar there is a limit of a cauchy sequence so every cauchy sequence has a convergent it converges and it converges to some point let's call it x bar for now so what i am going to show is this sequence is actually a cauchy sequence it satisfies this particular condition it satisfies this condition okay how should i go about proving it so let's uh, let's try to write some equations and hopefully it will lead us somewhere so what is x1 minus x0 no let's do x2 minus x1 this is equal to t of x1 minus t of x0 which is less than equal to beta x1 minus x0 let's look at x3 minus x2 
Do you see a pattern here? Yes. This is T of x1, so x2 is T of x1, x2 is T of x1, and x1 is T of x0. That's how I'm generating the sequence. Okay? Can you explain quickly how you got the beta squared? Right. So, so you understand all the way until here. Now I know that x2 minus x1 is less than or equal to beta times x1 minus x0. And then there is a beta here. So those two beta gets multiplied and we get beta square. Yes. We have a map that is a contraction. That's a contraction map. I generate a sequence starting from any initial condition. That sequence is going to converge to a fixed point of T. That's all it's saying. Using the map. You iteratively apply the same map again and again, and you get a sequence. Right, so I start with x0, I get x1 equals to t of x0, then I get x1, then I apply t of x1, I get x2, then I apply t of x2, I get x3, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if you think about it from a gradient descent perspective, we have xk plus 1. Notice that I'm picking a constant step size here. So I can define t of x equals to x minus alpha gradient of fx. Okay, so this is what the gradient descent with constant step size, you're applying the same function again and again. Right? Whenever you use while loop or for loop in your optimization algorithm, you're essentially applying the same function again and again, right? So that's what we are doing. We are showing that this sequence is going to converge. Okay, any other question? So what is the pattern? I want someone to pick up a pattern in this set of equations that I'm writing. People who are strong in the principle of mathematical induction, this is a challenge for you. What is the pattern that we see here? Okay, k or k minus 1? Wait. No, k. Right? Okay. So we can prove this by principle of mathematical induction. You know, we have the sequence that you can just uh, go through the same derivation and you will get this result. Now, what does Cauchy sequence say? I need to pick k and m greater than or equal to n epsilon, and then I need to show that this distance is less than epsilon. So what should I do? Let's pick xk plus n minus xk. So this is less than or equal to xk plus n minus x k plus n minus 1, x k plus n minus 1 minus x k plus n minus 2, x k plus 1 minus x k. This is by triangles inequality. Any questions so far? Straightforward. So how can we uh, use MATLAB to solve this? No, you are actually you have already implemented this in MATLAB like by 500 times until now in this course. So we are just learning why it works. Okay, it works in MATLAB, but now it's actually oh. working out on the board also. I know. So MATLAB working on this step. Yes. 
Right, so you are applying this sequence T again and again in MATLAB. I mean this map T again and again in MATLAB. So now we are proving that why does the sequence converge. Okay, so we have this. What is this term equal to? That is beta raised to k plus n minus 1 x 1 minus x 0 plus beta raised to k plus n minus 2 x 1 minus x 0 beta raised to k x 1 minus x 0. Who is finding a pattern here? Do you see a pattern there? Who is good with geometric series in the class? No one? <laughs> Who loves geometric series? No one? Come on, guys. Somebody has to love it. OK. Uh, what should I do here? So I'm going to write it on this side. So I have xk plus n minus xk is less than or equal to beta raised to k x1 minus x0. And then I have beta raised to n minus 1, beta raised to 0. OK. I'm going to go all the way to infinity. That's why I have a less than equal to sign here. People who love geometric series, I need the I need the sum of the series. Okay, great. So beta raised to k one minus beta x one minus x naught. Okay, so at least I went through this finding pattern puzzle, and we have been able to conclude that xk plus n minus xk is supposed to look something like this. Is this a Cauchy sequence? Is it a Cauchy sequence? So instead of writing k and m, both of them are greater than or equal to n epsilon, I'm going to make a small change here. And I'm going to write it as k plus m less than epsilon. And instead of saying m is greater than n epsilon, I'm just going to say m is in capital N. It's the same, same definition. There's no change in the definition. Now I have k plus n minus xk uh, is less than or equal to this. So what should I pick my n epsilon to be? So I need to pick, I want this to be less than epsilon. I need to pick n epsilon to be ceiling of 1 minus beta times epsilon over x1 minus x0. How do, oh, yeah, OK. So I'll take log of epsilon times 1 minus beta over x1 minus x0 over log of beta and the ceiling function. So if I pick my n epsilon to be larger than this integer, then in that case, my xk minus xk plus m will be less than epsilon. <coughs> right? 
Okay. So I have been able to figure out, I have been able to prove that the sequence that is generated out of this is actually a Cauchy sequence because for every epsilon greater than 0, I am able to find an n epsilon such that xk minus xk plus m is less than epsilon. So what do I get? The sequence xk converges to x bar. Okay, so any such sequence generated will converge to an x bar. What is left to be shown yet is that the limit is unique. That is, it will converge to x star. And no matter from where you start, no matter what your x naught is, you will converge to the same x star again, uh, like every time you start. So that still re remains to be shown. What I have proved is this xk converges to some x bar. Now, how am I going to show the uniqueness? So let's say, assume we have two fixed points. X, uh, x star and x bar, which means t of x star equals to x star, t of x bar equals to x bar. Let's say for the sake of argument that we have two distinct fixed points and x star is not equals to x bar. So I have two distinct points, separate points and both of them are fixed point of t. Maybe I start with some initial condition, I converge to x star. I start with some other initial condition and I converge to x bar. Okay, And those two are separate points. What is t of x star minus t of x bar? So what I get is, remember t of x star is t of x star. Sorry, t of x star is x star, t of x bar is x bar. So what this implies is x star minus x bar is less than equal to beta times x star minus x bar. Do you see a problem? What is the problem here? You have a positive value because we assume that x star is not equal to x bar. And so that positive value is less than something that's less than 1, something that's less than 1 times the positive value. Can that ever happen? It cannot happen. So our hypothesis that x star and x bar are distinct is false. So we'll, this leads to a contradiction, which means that x star is actually equal to x bar. Let me cross it out. So this is a contradiction. Okay, so that's uh, the proof of contraction mapping theorem. Any questions so far? No? No questions? Okay. Explain the n epsilon part again. I, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, so I want this, this whole thing.
to be less than epsilon, so, so that I can show that this term is less than epsilon. So I need to pick a value of k so that this whole thing is less than epsilon for every k greater than or equal to n epsilon. So what I'm going to do is, let me show you the derivation. So I want this term to be less than epsilon. So I want beta raised to k to be less than epsilon times 1 minus beta over norm of x1 minus x0. Now I can take, uh, now remember beta is strictly less than 1. Okay? So I can take log on both the sides. I'm going to assume that this thing is also less than 1. Because remember epsilon is supposed to be a small number. right? So I can assume that this is less than 1. So if I take log on both sides, I have k log beta is greater than log of this value. I mean, both of them are natural log. You know why this sign reverses? That's because beta is less than 1. So that's why the sign reverses. So beta is less than 1, this is less than 1. So I have like k log beta is greater than this. So this means that if k is, let me write it here. So if k is greater than log this over log beta, then this equation would hold, right? And n epsilon is supposed to be an integer. So I have to take the ceiling function. That's how I got that expression. Any other question? Let's try to apply this statement to the kind of algorithms we've been studying in this class. So let's start with the gradient descent. So I want to get to the Lagrange multiplier, the penalty method that we were talking about. But let's talk about the simplest one, which we have been discussing so far. Let's apply this to the gradient descent algorithm. Can I erase this side of the board? Has everyone noted down? OK. So I want to minimize f of x, x in Rn. I am going to construct my map as x minus alpha gradient of fx. For the sake of argument, let's assume that fx is convex. Uh, sorry, f is convex. So the second derivative is positive definite. How do I prove that this is a contraction map? Let me make even further simplification. Uh, I'm trying to think whether I should simplify it further or let it be. Let's, let's keep it like this. Okay, Let's try to understand what, what is happening here. So I need to know whether t is a contraction or not. So t of x1 minus t of x2, what is this equal to? So this would be x1 minus alpha gradient of fx1. minus x2 plus alpha gradient of fx2. How do I prove that this is a contraction? It seems difficult. Let's try to put our approximation hat on, because we have approximated the hell out of everything in this class. So let's try to approximate it again. So I'm going to say that x1 and x2 are close. What is t of x1 minus t of x2 approximately equal to? 
t of x1? No. No, no, no. X1 minus X2. Should I have the transpose there? I'm trying to think. Maybe I don't need a transpose. Everyone agrees with this approximation? OK. What is the norm of t of x1 minus t of x2? Based on this, I can just take it to be the norm of gradient of t of x1 times x1 minus x2. Oh, maybe it's not an upper bound. It's just an approximation. Because it's an exact, it's an approximation. So this one will be an approximation. What is this less than equal to? What is this less than equal to? And what is gradient of t of x1? i minus alpha, second derivative of f at x1. So what kind of uh, result are we getting here? What kind of result are we getting here? So the kind of result, roughly, is that if the spectral radius of the derivative is less than 1, then this map is a contraction. And then we will converge to the fixed point of t. OK? So let me put it more mathematically correctly now oh I don't have time right now so okay so let me do this uh, I'm going to start from here in the next class we'll talk about how to put it in a mathematical language what exactly the result says and then we'll connect it to the Lagrangian method that we were talking about at the beginning of this class you have a question From here to here, here to here, yeah, so this, this is a matrix, right? So I'm taking the spectral radius of the matrix, row of the matrix times the norm of x1 minus x2. That's the same as what we had done a little bit a while ago, okay? All right, so I have your midterm papers here, so I'll distribute it after I turn off the camera. Thank you.